Welcome! In this series of short videos, we will look at topics common to both the PowerBasic console and Windows compilers. Today we will look at creating a contact simulator using a graphics window and graphics commands. We're going to do something a little different today. Rather than cover the design of the program and code first and then show you the finished program at the end of the video, we're going to demo the program first and then deconstruct how it was created after. This is a contact simulator that allows you to monitor a number of houses or social environments and the people that live and work around them, tracking contacts between them and possible infections and how they might spread. I'm not an epidemiologist, but I thought that looking at how an application might be developed to simulate this would be a good way to demonstrate some of the things that PowerBasic can do with graphics windows and graphics commands. The simulation here is tracking five houses or social environments, with currently 10 people per house. This simulation is started with two people infected. And after half of the first day has passed, these two people will then start to pass the infection on to anyone that gets close to them. Now currently most of the infections are appearing in the brown house with one infection in the green. So far the remainder of the other houses are unaffected. The houses on this PowerBasic application are displayed using the polygon command. The individuals, who are moving in a quite random manner, are actually drawn using the graphics box control, with a rounding setting of 100, which basically turns the box into a circle. The graphics commands are also used to display the charts on the right hand side. The first chart is one column for each of the seven days of our simulation showing you how many people were actually infected on the first day, how many in the second, and so on. The green line we see here shows you how many people were infected on the first day as opposed to how many on the second day, whereas the columns are effectively cumulative. Currently there are nine people infected. And we can see the majority of those are in the brown house, some in the green, and one in the light blue house. At the moment the simulation is set to run for seven days with no recovery mode. That means anyone who does get infected won't stay infected for the duration of the simulation. Now since the movement of the people in this simulation is fairly random, we can see that some of the people are keeping a reasonable social distance away from those who are infected. The individuals in the simulation are actually free to roam anywhere in the main area of the map. Now we're on to the third day. Now obviously in this particular simulation since all the people infected will continue to move around it's in theory only a matter of time before everyone in the entire simulation does get infected. However, let's shake this up a little bit. If we close the application here and we have a look at the application itself, there are a few things we can actually tweak. It's set for a maximum of five houses, ten people per house. There are seven days and there are 1500 time periods within each day. The maximum distance beyond which you will not get infected is five units and the maximum of the people infected when the simulation starts is 2. So if we change this to increase the number of people per house to 20 and we'll turn the recovery mode on. This means that after being infected the person will stay infected for this number of periods. Which since there are 1500 periods per day they'll stay infected for two days. After the two days they will then become uninfected. So we try running this now to see how it changes our simulation. We started off with two people infected, all of them in the white blue house at the top of the screen. 
Now I set the program so that it would not reinfect anyone else until half of the first day has passed to allow all the little individuals to move further away from each other before the infection starts. Without doing that, everyone in a house with one person infected in it would become instantly infected. So we are now at the point where anybody close to those infected will pick up an infection and we'll see the infection is going quite rapidly in the blue house. And it so far is the only house that's being affected. We're now on to day two. So once we go into day three, those who were initially infected will start to recover and their little icon will change back to the original colour. Now we're probably fairly close to getting someone in the brown house infected but they're managing to keep the social distance quite nicely. Using the constants at the beginning of the program, you can set your parameters quite nicely. At the moment it will run for 7 days, but you can set it to a larger number, for example 14 or 48. Now we do have one from the light blue house who's wandering quite far down. He's now into the brown territory, but not near anyone. We're now into day 3. So halfway through day three, the first people who have been infected will start to recover. And we should see the number of infections in the light blue house start to decline. And in this particular simulation, we may well not have any other houses affected at all. And we're now starting to get some recoveries and some reinfections. The way this system works at the moment is if someone does recover from the virus um, there's nothing to stop them being reinfected almost straight away. And there we have our first burn infected. Now it should start to spread quite rapidly now. The one thing these simulations actually show is obviously the importance of social distancing. Right, let's try another simulation and we'll up the number slightly. Right, we'll go to 25 people a house. We'll start off with 5 for the number of infections and we'll try running that. Now we have more people per house and we've also got infections in two houses to start off with. 3 in the light blue. and two in the brown house. Now once we get halfway through the first day, which we now got to, we'll see that the number of infections will rise quite rapidly because the squirrel, there are quite a lot of people within range in both the blue and the brown houses. Now this particular scenario will probably mean our simulation will progress quite quickly and we'll get a larger number of infections now the first entries into the greenhouse and I would say that all of the blue house have now been infected and the only ones not infected in the brown house are those who are keeping a reasonable distance from the rest who are infected And we have some in the purple house now. So it is spreading quite rapidly. But the focus of the infection is still in the light blue and the brown houses. And as I said before, when we go on to day three, we'll start to see our first recoveries. So all houses have some infection except the red house, which is the furthest away. Obviously the green one's likely to shoot up shortly.
So we should see people starting to recover fairly soon. There we go. There's the people who are in the light blue house starting to recover now. And some are being reinfected almost straight away. And some in the brown house. However, the number of reinfections is keeping pace with those who are recovering. We still have no one in the red house who has been affected so far. Oh, there's one. That's our first red one. So from running these simulations, it's fairly obvious to see that the more crowded a social environment is to start with, the faster the infection will actually spread. So let's have a look at the code behind all of this. Now I've designed this program to work under both the console compiler and the Windows compiler. What we're doing for the console compiler, we have a conditional command if the console compiler is actually in use, to turn the console off. That way the only thing running in the application is the graphics window. And we have a few user-defined types used for polygons or polylines, a number of arrays to keep track of everything, and the constants which drive the system. The number of houses, which is five, I've set the number of houses almost fixed at five uh, because you need to assign more colors if you want more houses. However, the number of people per house is selectable. You can push that up. The max periods is the number of time periods per day in the simulation. You could reduce or increase this. Uh, the max distance is how far the person has to be from the next person in order to have the danger of infection. The larger this number is, the easier it will be to get infected. The max number of days is the max number of days in the simulation. Again, you can increase this. And the max infected is the maximum number of people who will be infected at the beginning of the simulation. If recovery is set to true, then the people will recover within this time period. So within 3000, which is twice the max periods of a day, so that is effectively two days. So two days after they get infected, they will recover. Now the other constants I've got set up are for the size of the map and the width of the charts. This is designed this way so that the little people won't actually wander onto the charts. Now the PB main, which obviously is the first routine in your program, we dimension the number of days and the array which keeps track of how many infections we have per day. We're now into the kernel of the application. There are four constants set up here, a handle for the graphics window, a handle for the font we're going to be using on that window, a local variable for the day counter, which day we're actually on, and a local variable for the period within that day. We then create the graphics window with a title, assigning it to this handle. And then we do the attach, which means anything we send to the graphics stream will be sent to that window. We're using the redraw command to say not to redraw the graphics window until we actually tell the program to do it by using graphic redraw. The reason for this is this vastly increases the efficiency of the graphics subsystem and will make the screen updates much quicker. I'm using the graphics scale command to set the scale I want this to display at. This allows you to have this graphics window of any size you wish and you don't have to change the rest of the program's coordinate system. We can then create a new font to use within our graphics window and we're setting it to use this font by default. I'm then using a graphics clear command to clear the screen and fill it in solid black. Since we'll be making heavy use of the randomize function, we randomize it using the timer. Then we have some preparatory functions to set the colors per house, to place the houses on the graphics map and to prepare the people. The Output of results function is the one that draws the graphs on the screen. This will draw them initially on the screen and then we can start processing. There are two for next loops nested within each other. 
one for the days and one for the periods within the day. Now the next line of code is the important one. Since for both the console compiler and the Windows compiler we're using just a graphics window. Now if the user closes the graphics window the application itself would keep running. There would be no window to display anything but the application would continue to run in the background until it gets to the end of the simulation. What this line of code is doing is as it starts each new period it's checking using the isWindow function which is one of the Windows API functions to see if the handle we got for the graphics window is still effectively there. If the graphics window is still running it will be ignored and it will go on to continue the simulation. Using the exit exit command it means you're instructing PowerBasic to exit the first loop and also exit the second loop. So it would take you right down to the end of the simulation, output the final results and then quit. So within this main period we're outputting results, we're placing houses and we're moving the people around. And then and only then do we redraw all the graphics, sleep for 25 milliseconds and then go on to the next period. And at the end of each period we're redisplaying the graphics again. And at the end of our loops we are setting a message on the screen to say the simulation's ending, doing a final redraw of the graphics, while then waiting 5 seconds and then we're closing the graphics window down and closing the font and ending the function which ends the application. So if we have a look at these in detail set colors is doing nothing particularly epic it's redimensioning the colors array for the number of houses we have and setting a color for each house. If you're doing any more houses you would have to actually add additional lines of code to put in more colors. The place houses function is redimensioning the houses array which is a user defined type and placing them with coordinates so they will appear correctly on screen and then using the graphics polygon command which we covered in a previous video to draw the polygon on the screen with the fill color of our selection. The prep people does much the same thing only for the people. It has a user defined type which is set up for the number of houses times the number of people per house. So if there are 10 people per house, 5 houses, 50 people. And inside this user find type we're storing the house number, we're storing the x and y coordinates which are basically taken from the location of the house initially and then we're calling a fun infected routine. The fun infected routine gives the person a 1 in 20 chance of being infected. Now if this result returns 1 then we're coming into here where we're checking to make sure that the uh, number infected so far is not greater than the maximum number that can be infected. The movement of the people is handled in the move people function. This is really running around the user defined type checking to see if the person can recover. This is the part of the code that actually tests to see if they're infected and if they are infected it then works out how long they've been infected for. If they've been infected for long enough then it will mark them as being no longer infected. The next part actually changes the person's location and we have a subroutine in here which does the simulation of the movement. Within this function it actually simulates in which direction we want the person to move. Again using a little random number generator on the eight directions the person could actually move. Working out the distance they are from the house they started in. And this is a part of the code that works out how close they are to someone who is infected. With the test if we are still in the first day and within half of the first day then we do nothing. Only after that do we actually mark the person as infected. Now the other part of the code where we output the results. Let me just run the simulation again to remind you of what our graphs looked like. We have two basic graphs on the screen, one which charts the infections per day and one that charts the infections per house. These are basically bar charts. All of them are actually using the graphics box command for the columns 
and the line that appears in the infections per day is a graphics polyline. So if we have a look at the code, we're basically storing the infection count for that particular day and we are drawing on the screen the first chart. Most of this is arithmetic to work out where on the screen the chart's actually to go. And there's the graphics box command that draws the blue border around the graphics chart. The graphics line commands are the X and Y coordinate lines, displayed in red. And we're titling our chart infections per day. Then working out the vertical size of a single infection. Since in this case we can actually increase the number of people at the beginning of the program, this takes that into an account and for each of the days we will draw a column. And we'll also prepare the polygon array, which is our polyline command, drawn down here in light green, showing the number of infections for each of the days. The beauty of the count within the user-defined type is that since we're drawing initially just day one, the count is one. Therefore, even if all the other elements are actually populated with numbers, it won't draw them. So when you're on day two, it will draw the line between day one and day two. And when you're on day three, it will draw day one to two, and then day two to day three. And then on our second graph, we do exactly the same thing. But in this case, there's no polyline command in this one. This is purely driven by the data coming out of the house infections array. And the final information box is just printing out information on the constants. How many total days are in the simulation, uh, whether we're in recovery mode or not, and how many initial infections there are. So with only 500 lines of code, you can simulate something that is indeed quite complex using just a few graphics commands. That's it for today. Thank you for watching.